sure there's lots of folks here that can kick off the discussion. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Dill. Um, yeah, so the the goal of this session is to have a um, a discussion about um, how to make hackathons, specifically HAPIC hackathons uh, in the XR space, uh, more inclusive uh, and um, give people with physical disabilities um, um, a, a, a fair ground to compete and collaborate so that when we are building accessible uh, products or accessible ideas and prototypes in hackathons, we do have um, like people on the ground experiencing um, the, the accessibility needs on a day-to-day -day basis being an active part of uh, the process of creation and ideation. Um, as I've been uh, myself uh, involved in many hackathons, uh, I've been, uh, I, I was leading hackathons in New York uh, in the XR space, and I've been um, to, to many of the uh, MIT reality hackathons. Um, and um, equity and inclusion and accessibility are really a, a top of mind in those hackathons. There are things that uh, are really important. Uh, making a software inclusive and for everyone is extremely important. Um, but what I've been seeing is that people that are very have a ha have a good will to solve problems, but then they are lacking the resources and the uh, feedback from people that are experiencing uh, problems with the software. So they are usually, and I'm myself, I'm guilty of that. Uh, we're, we're taking anecdotal uh, approaches. We're seeing, I see a, a problem that might be a problem for someone with a disability, but I don't have the resource or the action or the, the, um, the connection or had not the connection to a person to actually interview and integrate into my uh, ideation process and uh, how to actually build something that's useful or that's actually really uh, like dr dr driven from the, the source of the need instead of me putting up a layer that I think is an assumption based on my limited ability to empathize and understand how people with disabilities are interacting with software. Does that make sense? Right? So our goal here is to first um, outline what goes into a hackathon and what are the guidelines and the um, and the rules or the, the, the makeup of a hackathon. And then I would like to ideate with everyone here involving um, to, to see what, can, uh, what kind of guidelines or what kind of rules can we create to make the space of a hackathon more inclusive, whether that is um, like access to assistive technology, whether it is um, access to um, ASL or captions in learning sessions, which are usually part of a hackathon and the, like there's a huge learning part in the beginning, then there, uh, and then there's a creation part uh, where something gets created. So you get familiarized with the technology and then you're building the technology to solve another problem that you came up with. Um, sometimes people bring problems that they want to solve into a hackathon, some hackathon, real, um, um, are built in a in a space where you get give given a challenge and you solve with a piece of software uh, that challenge. So it's on the fly, it's on the moment, it's right there. So um, so I wanna wanna um, open up with a with a question. Um, so first, I wanna know like who here uh, in this in this group that we have has actively participated in the hackathon in the past. Can we can see a show of hands here? Okay. So I can see four. All right, that's good. Um, and and two of the four are actually. <laughs> Um, actively building one of the, the largest XR hackathon in the world, which is the MIT Reality Hack. Um, so <clears throat> maybe, maybe I can just throw that curveball to you, Brian. You can tell me, like, what are the biggest logistical pieces that make up the MIT hackathon? 
Oh, where to begin? <laughs> um, staffing, I think, is the biggest one. Um, it's uh, especially when you're a volunteer based um, organizing team, uh, you you run into a lot of issues with um, volunteer staffing. Some Sometimes it's hard to especially on really tight deadlines and there's a lot of moving parts that need to be accomplished. Sometimes it is hard to um, get enough people to um, even fill in the most basic gaps um, on your team. Um, so I would say like staffing is a really big issue um, mm -hmm. in, in, in hackathons. Um, space management, I would say is another big one. Um, especially the larger your hackathon is, the more space, physical space that you need for various moving parts of the hackathon so um and as you can imagine um the bigger the space the harder it is to book potentially because you need very specific you have very specific requirements for your hackathon and you know this is dependent on each hackathon but you would generally want you know most of the hacking and most of the participants in one space to um kind of kindle a spirit of creative energy mm -hmm. um and I, another big part is if your hackathon has workshops and topics that you want uh folks to be educated beforehand um maybe there is an in-person workshop component to your hackathon or a series of online hackathon components um or sessions you would want to make sure that you have um, you can reach out to the appropriate subject matter experts to fill in those education gaps. Um, there's a lot as well to the day to day, especially when you, you know, you can have the best laid plans and all your best laid plans can turn upside down at a moment's notice and managing those fires um, every single day um, with limited staff can can also be a really big uh, logistical challenge. So I would say those are the top top ones. I could probably go talk a lot about challenges. <laughs> but no, I would I, say those are the biggest ones. This is thank you, Brian. This is a really good outline about what's going uh, on in the logistics of facilitating a hackathon, um, and and that will give us the amount of empathy we need in order to understand, <laughs> like what uh, Miles is finally joining us. So um, I'm gonna. Um, I'm going to give the microphone to Miles because uh, we've been waiting for him. But I think that it's uh, it's a good primer what we heard from Brian about the the logistical challenges and the like the pure the pure ma magnitude of what uh, MIT's hackathon entitles and and and, um, and we can talk more uh, in the Q and A afterwards after Miles is uh, done with his presentation about like other uh, like opportunities how to like help not only logistically, but also on the actual core of what a hackathon is supposed to do, like the creative space, right? Okay, so Miles, whenever you're ready, uh, I'm recording and uh, the floor is yours. Um, I'm trying to find the captions here to get the captions turned on. Hey, this is Dylan. Uh, so the Zoom still does not support captions for breakout rooms. Um, so we have provided uh, links in the Slack channels on the symposium Slack uh, for each uh, each room. So those of you go to uh, the Slack and then um, the symposium Slack, not the normal XR access Slack, uh, and go to deep dive B1 hackathons. Uh, there is a captions link there. Okay. Now I'm ready, I think.
Mm -hmm. I found the captioning. Okay. Perfect. I'm be looking back and forth. I've got separate screens going, one for captioning, just to let you know why I'm looking back and forth. How are you doing, Roland? Are you enjoying yourself this week? Yes, I'm having a blast. <laughs> Thank you. OK, so now this uh, separate group, now this deep dive topic is inclusion, right? This hackathon to clarify that. Okay. I know we've had some experience with supporting other hackathons this year. I think MIT related hackathon. Okay, let me see the captioning here. Hang on a second. Okay. Reality. Okay. I'm curious of how many of your experiences with that reality relation there. I'm sorry, I missed that, Lacey. I was turning on my captions. <laughs> okay. Relation there with physical MIT for the reality hack, right? Okay. I'm going to ask Roland here. Hi, Roland. You're there, right? Okay. Your experience with uh, the events, what is your point of view, your perspective on that for disability inclusion? Well known, hack persistently, continuously, good. Is it organized? Things like that. Now with the RX access, people like me, you, and others, and fill in when they join from their hack, the goals, I mean, like supporting disability inclusion. So networking only through Discord, Roland, there in person, right? You're there? Yes. Yes. So what my experience is uh, or was. So uh, since I have been part of many of those events, and specifically, I see uh, how, how um, the MIT hackathon has made uh, improvements towards uh, inclusion and accessibility. Um, so what I, what I know um, is that for each of the hackathons, there's several components. Like there's, um, from, from a logistical point, right? There are sponsors, there are software sponsors that come in into a hackathon and they have pieces of software they want to coach and teach and they want the hackers to work with those pieces of software, whether it's an API, whether it's a crypto, uh, um, like a blockchain software, whether it's, a corporation like Microsoft or Magic Leap that create hardware or have software like MRT kits or any kind of um, other like pieces that are novel and are modern in that space. Hackathons are exciting events where 
novel software is being tinkered with by creative minds uh, within a very short amount of time to create um, um, solutions for everyday problems or find new opportunities to make life better, uh, specifically for MIT and their mission statement. And I don't want to paraphrase, I know Brian and uh, Ian are here. So I just want to like allude to the idea that uh, MIT always has the higher good in mind and it wants to solve something that has a social good aspect to it. And that's why accessibility is top of mind for MIT as well. Um, the reason why I did not hack this year, but I wanted to be a mentor is because I wanted to give uh, accessibility resource. Like I wanted to be there for people that wanted to challenge um, like uh, the one wanted to challenge to solve an accessibility problem and give my time as mentor and coach to the hackers because I've seen the need and I've hacked myself in the past at MIT and I brought my own knowledge and I didn't have anyone really there to help. So that's why I made it this time my mission to be part of the hackathon organization as a mentor, as a resource, as a point of access to XR access, to give people a chance to ask deeper questions and put in perspective what they're trying to solve. So that's that's my that's the reason uh, that's the reason like my most recent experience is that actively solving a problem that I saw was had need to be solved, like the access and the knowledge, you know. Yes. Okay. My experience has been also mentoring there as well at MIT, really not uh, physically there. Mixer for me is what I had and I wanted to be there in person, but to support the people and meet various people in the community there. But unfortunately it was a challenge finding an interpreter. So that was kind of messed up. There was no communication access. I requested it early, I think like three weeks prior, but unfortunately, you know, it was COVID related and there was a struggle with that, trying to find an interpreter who was willing to be there in person. So they had to cancel the flight there. It was a, it was a sad thing. So I missed that opportunity, unfortunately. I'm hoping in the future that they will improve and be ready with support for people with different disability needs who do show up in person to be there and support them. The positive was from that uh, event was it allowed us to set up accessibility groups, specifically focusing on support projects, people who wanted to have prioritized access or just generally the project was a question and answer of how we could gain more experience with accessibility. It was really cool that some of the teams really, the, there was opportunities there for questions and answers that really was a cool thing was that, you know, I really enjoyed that event for the accessibility focus on that project there to see how often and if the teams wanted to make accessibility a function of our, make it a priority, make it an app. And that's my experience there. So that was what I saw. So I know I saw some names of people, Brian, Kui is here, I think, or he was there as a coordinator from MIT, RIT Hack. So I don't know if he wanted to join in the conversation here or not, or add some comments, you know, from what he's heard and seen on Slack. I'm sure he had an opportunity to want to respond to his thoughts and maybe brainstorm and 
partner with MIT, RIT Hack, and also RX Access as well. So people could partner. Brian, are you here? You don't need to respond. I'm just curious if you wanted to drop in some comments. Hey, Miles. Yeah, I'm here. Um, my One of the organ, other organizers, uh, Ian, is also here with me um, today. So, um, well, I, I agree. And yeah, I, I, I wonderful. Want to, I want to, you know, apologize for the poor experience that you had. And, you know, it was definitely this year was a really good first step to, um, you know, just learn more about providing accessibility accommodations. So I'm hoping that we can do better next year um, and, you know, in, start this process earlier. And, you know, I, I know a lot this year you made, um, you were interested in perhaps participating next year or, or coming back as a mentor, um, you know, and we would love um, either of those options. And I am, um, I think I'm not sure if you joined yet, but one of the um, Roland did ask kind of what the biggest logistical challenges were um, of setting up such a large hackathon. And I responded, my number one concern, our team's number one concern really was the um, very, very tight staffing um, on our volunteer team. So I, I, would I would suggest, I guess, to anyone else planning a hackathon, um, and especially for those like us that had never had accessibility accommodations before that you would want to um, dedicate one person to be the um, accessibility coordinator, um, at least to, to think about it early and to get the ball rolling early. Um, and, and if you want to be um, accessible to all different kinds of abilities. I think that is a good first step and, you know, a very big learning point for us as well. Hi, Ian here. Um, I'm also one of the organizers at the MIT Reality Hackathon. And um, I also share a similar sentiment where um, we always hope to do our best um, to provide equal access to everybody, but with the, the constraints that we had, it, it, um, our best laid plans kind of fell apart, but it is fantastic. Like, um, similarly, as was mentioned earlier, that the conver this has spurred new conversations to be had about how we can do better for the next year and focusing on that. Um, and where I'm maybe, I'm a little bit more new to organizing events. Um, and this has a, a been a, a big learning experience for me about how I can do better to organize events in the future. For instance, um, I was working actively during this past hackathon to try and set up a live captioning system on Zoom that would trigger automatically when you join in. And just through going through and working with their software, I found that there were some uh, limitations of what was available where the, you could enable live captions, but they wouldn't trigger automatically unless you hook up like a third party um, interface to be able to do it through there. Um, and then even earlier in this call, we mentioned that like the captioning isn't available on breakout rooms, that there's some of these like small limitations that exist. And so one of the things that I think is great about being able to have these conversations is like sharing resources. If people are familiar about um, a, a great way of doing automatic captioning to provide these accessibility options, or if there's tools that exist that make it easier to implement um, uh, for teams, then uh, that's a great place where we can all uh, expand together. And I'd love to bring that into our event for next year so that we can provide that better access to everyone. Thank you so much for your valuable insight here and for sharing your perspective. Um, I'm not trying to um, call anyone out on mistakes or trying to dwell on any errors. I know that this is the first time that we're really taking advantage of thinking deeply and coordinating to talk about accessibility for these events. And so as we are evaluating, the point is to figure out what is working and what is not working and what 
what is our end goal here? What can we continue working on to continuously improve? So what do we want to see improve more specifically today? So um, I am curious about the hybrid aspect of things. Um, we have networking and, and resources, and we also have things that we can do in person. But as we try to uh, separate this out, we often are seeing that very similar models are coming out. So the challenges for providing ac for access are, be are increasingly becoming more difficult. But now that we're all here, what ideas do you have? What can you suggest to make accessibility more just part of what we do without having to have the expectations of, oh, we're going to have to increase funding and increase staff just to address these issues. But if we are dealing with this from the get-go, maybe if we have a coordinator and person who can help set things up and for all these limitations that we're experiencing, identify these and start working on them, what um, I'll go ahead and turn the floor over to some other people who may want to add some comments. You can also add your comments um, in Slack um, for our channel here. It's the Deep Dive B1 Hackathon. And so go ahead and add your questions and comments and we'll see if we have enough time to respond to everyone. So what solutions out there already exist that can help us plan to establish accessibility more independently rather than just saying oh we're gonna have to raise all these funds to add this in after the fact so maybe we can start with trying to discuss solving the captions issue for the first example Trying to see if there's any comments, if anyone wants to add anything, any suggestions for improvements, any, any comments about independence and accessibility. Okay, got going on here. So right now I'm looking at our Slack channel. I just want to, I see one from Dylan Fox posted a link. What was it? Our access needs um, to for the programming of the XR, I'm sorry, we're going to back this up. So XR programs, the available, right now we're talking from the Slack things. So in the Hackathon B1 Slack channel, the XRA Hackathon. The goals for that group that we can touch on and share what do you know any suggestions any things that anything that we think that a project should be focusing on as it relates to XR access maybe as it relates to captions for all any cool projects that we have going on for accessibility to share resources um, and I do see one question here one moment will I so the question is from, I believe that was Charon, Karen, sorry. So for our online virtual hackathons, would you say those are more or less accessible compared to in-person hackathons? Let me just make sure that the captions are clear on this one real quick. Okay, perfect. Okay. So I just wanted to make check for accuracy here. Um, 
And so I will just open it up to the floor. If anyone wants to chime in here, uh, the floor is yours. I'm gonna, um, <clears throat> this is Roland. Roland? Yes, so I'm just gonna, uh, like there's, there's a, a very interesting aspect <clears throat> about online hackathons versus in-person hackathons. So because of COVID and the pandemic, a lot of hackathons have been directed remote. Um, I think it is possible to do an online hackathon. It's definitely uh, a possibility in like logistics and it has, it has, it has, it has its place. Um, very much like online schooling has a place. But I think the, 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 the important part of a hackathon is the isolation and location, the place of energy that you have in a look in the networking, the person to person contact, the actual being in a space and the hustle and just seeing people around you working their butts off to get something out of the door that cannot be replicated in a virtual and online environment. And that, and, and there's another part of this as well, where in an online hackathon, <clears throat> you have very little oversight and control of how many people are working on something, what, uh, what help they get, what resources they use, it's much less of a fair environment because of the lack of transparency and the lack of oversight. I understand that in an online environment, people with disabilities can use assisted technology to the fullest extent. And that is the unifying kind of layer where you have access to a device that is your, your transcription of your work that can be like, made to your needs, whether it is someone that uses their laptop on their lap or someone that uses um, a, a, like, um, like a Bry keyboard or anything kind of assistive technology to enable them to consume content on the, on the, on the, on the computer. So that is a unifier. <clears throat> However, hacking in person has its unique kind of characteristic and value. So therefore, I understand also that um, like the giving out of prices, the awarding of rewards, that is a challenge by itself. So if you have factors that are unknown and not in control, like giving out prices and awarding rewards that might have, may have monetary value, may have like access to software for a certain time of free sponsoring, um, that, that kind of gets tricky. So for online, um, it's probably something more of a, uh, like a, a challenge that you do over a period of time. Um, but for an in-person hackathon, that's just a different energy. So I'm, I am, from my opinion, <clears throat> always in favor of having people on the spot, in location, on, on, um, in that environment, so you can see how they problem solve, how they collaborate, how they lead or are led by team leaders or lead teams. That, that is also a very fertile ground for the sponsors and the people that are hovering those events to recruit their, their next employees. That's another layer, but like I've talked about the sponsors bringing in new pieces of software, but people can explore cutting edge technology and finagle in their APIs that are sometimes not even completely finished APIs. They have hackers show where the bugs are that their own teams didn't discover because they are just not enough hands on board and having like those, those hackers work with those APIs will give them a richer insight on how they solve and make better software themselves, right? So there's a, there's a reason why sponsors come in and have the software tinkered with. There's a reason why sponsors come in and see the next employee potentially being in the, in the crowd of very smart people engaged and energetic. And I think that having people with disability be part of that physicality, be part of that team, 
is giving them equal access to the opportunity of networking, to the opportunity of getting hired, to the opportunity of leading teams that they don't have if they're isolated in the, in the online world, right? So that's my, my take on that. So we shouldn't, we shouldn't compare it. And I think that making, an access, uh, making accessibility part of real life hackathons and person hackathons is a much larger value than having those live into uh, like try to make it the same thing. <clears throat> I agree. I agree. Good points. And I agree that many benefits are there for in-person hackathons. We want, we recognize that. And I'm curious about how we could still take advantage of networking part, you know, thinking about that, like the networking piece, people tend to be more accessible for that. Compared to this, you know, physical disabilities might be easier. Put a pause on that. Maybe support setting up captioning or things like that. So I wanted to continue to correlate these two: the, you know, the hackathon in person, the ones that are done via networking, and listen to both things. What we have, like you have IR, and soon like maybe more streamlined switching back and forth between the two, the physical portion, and then you have the network online portion. So trying to visualize that. If it's feasible. So anybody else want to join here into the discussion about how we could be more inclusive with the hackathons? What does that mean? What does it look like? What are your experiences with that? You know, for the future at least, what we can see happening. Miles, my, for myself, from my point of view, Crime space. Crime space. So with the VR concept and accessibility using that, developing captioning for that, different languages with VR. Okay, so I'm not sure how much time we have left here. I'm curious if we could use what time we have left maybe to discuss if we, our group here, our community, if we could design or set up hackathon, what would it look like? Is it possible? You know, how would it function? You know, make a list of what we have to do in that regard. My goal here is to really set up a disabled focus hackathon, not a general hackathon. You know, we could add that, but no, I didn't want to do that to make the general community. I'm going to see if possible if the disability community could set up and guide and lead developing that as being the mentors here, rolling up our sleeves and possibly focusing on this project and bring it to finality. Make that part of our mission. So I'm curious if what the interest is out there, what's happened in that regard. You know, you can type, uh, your, we can type out a proposal or something like that. What would it look like? Would it be in network internet only uh, for one day, two days? What software would we need to use? I'm spending, I'm looking at comments, what we have so far. I can see like for the future, if disability were to lead the hackathon, is that a possibility? I see a comment from Delilah. Okay, I see that happening too. Yes, I agree.
is in typing right now. I see that in Slack, someone's typing. Captioning error, I think. Okay, hang on. Delia. Not, not Delia. We're getting the name wrong. Keith, Keith. Sorry, interpreter error. Great question. Keith said, ask me, what is the role for people who were to show up and go to a hackathon? What is the role themselves? What would be the design role? How will we be parse that out? I'm bringing it up here on my screen here to provide that typing that out, what the role might be, we could share with them. Roland, what is your experience in this regard, really regarding that? Um, yeah, so I'll go take this. Um, so like what are the, the question uh, on Slack is what are, uh, what, are, what are the typical roles of people who attend hackathons? Are they assigned responsibilities such as design code? Yes. Um, yeah, so at MIT hackathons and in general hackathons, there are people that come with different kind of strengths. And um, as far as I know, the recruiting for hackathons is not the discriminatory towards only people that code, even though hackathon is very much focused around code. I think the, the power of a very good hackathon is to have a diverse group of people that can ideate in a team together to find a solution that is uh, not a technical solution, but it's a valid solving uh, a solution for a problem. And in that case, like um, storytellers, designers, uh, maybe like um, or coders or, uh, or like 3D artists, they gather together with a, with a concept and then they all each do their part uh, at their best ability to shape a solution, a visual, a, a prototype that showcases the power of the solution that they bring to the table for a common problem that they define in the beginning. So in, when, when we're thinking about how do we integrate people with accessibility needs into that mix, I think that like accessibility obviously is not a defining factor of the ability to collaborate. I mean, it will be, um, it will be part of what they bring to the table, but uh, a per person with a visual disability might be a really good storyteller or maybe a really good um, ideator or might know how to time scope and lead a team to success, even though he might not have, uh, like he, he might be writing uh, his, his, his commands, his guidance, over his laptop because he does not see a visual. So, so there is, it's, it's, it's a, a, a setup of different kind of aspects of every person that joins a hackathon to make that such a rich experience. So I think that one of the things that we, we can think about to integrate, like, like, do we want to create a hackathon that is mainly focused on disability and, and have people with all across the entire spectrum from like uh, visual to physical to auditory to all the sensory disabilities that we know um, and have that be the source um, of, um, uh, that, that'd be the resource to create ha hacks. That, I, then I would have to think which would they cluster themselves into each of their categories and what they want to solve for their own categories. Does that make sense? Maybe it makes sense. I have not thought about it that way. And I haven't thought about it that way for a specific reason, because I think it's much more important to integrate people with those disabilities in the everyday core of people that we have 
in hackathons that are focused around um, a certain medium like XR or AI or machine learning or whatever. Like, let's say there's a, MI, a IBM hackathon that lo looks at, uh, at uh, um, machine learning automation, right? So I want people with disabilities to join that group to give the existing teams or the people that have joined hackathons in the past and haven't been exposed to a broader, a wider range of people with physical disabilities to empathize and build with them in mind. You, you, you need to expose people that um, are in those hackathon groups to people with different disabilities so that they can just start solving problems with the inclusive mindset. So therefore, I rather have people with disabilities join the group, support them in their disability needs to be included, and then make this a normalization, an exposure experiment as well, rather than isolating them and having them build their own flagship hackathon, which has probably its own validity, but it will be always treated as an experiment rather than an inclusion. So that's what my take on that is. Thank you. And I do want to know, do we have, we have just over 10 minutes left. So this is our 10 minute warning. So if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to add them in there now. And if we have any time available, we will do our best to respond. So Roland, um, I, so what is going on? What do you see out there in general, out there in, in, in the, for the big hackathons? Um, we've seen things happen over and over again, and we're seeing an, an increased access as the goal in mind for people with disabilities. In my life experience, I'm a disabled person. I'm deaf. I need access to things. There are things going on. I have no clue what they are, obviously. People with disabilities need a coordination team and a coordinating team leader for each project. And in terms of barriers for myself, I'm not alone. There are many people and creators out there with disabilities who want to join these efforts to break down these barriers to provide access so they can be there and they can, you know, with this lived experience, bring that to the table. You know, some there is frustration that comes from these barriers because disabled folks want to be involved, but the barriers even getting involved in the first place. So what can we do here? What can we develop and establish with our core team of disabled people to begin guiding us through this process to come up with a better way of accommodating the needs of disabled people. And to mean in their environment, is their environment accessible for starters? And, you know, if I think about the dreams that I would like to show what we can do with our leadership, I want people to be able to learn from us and to copy our approaches, you know, and then we will start noticing these creative solutions being applied more broadly, or at least that's what I hope for in terms of improving accessibility um, to include more disabled people. That's the outcome I hope for and my thought process in thinking about what an inclusive hackathon would be and what we need to show what how inclusion looks you know so you know i'm trying to think about other hacks that i've joined they've had very small or or or, or been very slow to discuss some of these things which is why i wanted to start it from the beginning you know and uh, anyway, that's how that's how I believe we can solve this is uh, be a little more proactive about it. So um, there's you know there's nothing about us that you know these core principles or philosophies that are based on in this project. 
that we can't do. We can, whatever we imagine, I know we can implement. And so it would be nice to see the coordinator, a coordinator leader, maybe a, a disabled developer or a disabled researcher or tester or you have all disabled people involved and partnered with us to support us, uh, you know, not just having disabled people to join and learn, but also to have them lead as well. And so for my position on this in terms of advocacy, um, that's one of the other things that I want to make sure is included in there as well. Um, disability developers and creators and in the XR industry, I want to see uh, more of this happening today. Okay, so um, I'm, now, I'm not seeing any comments, but let me double check here. Um, okay, Ian, I do see your comment about Hackathons typically are a social event for developers and everyone involved, researchers and whatnot, to have a strong teaming activity together and diversity to come up with creative products and to make sure that those creative products are available. Um, I did want to uh, go ahead and continue on that that comment for you, Ian. So right now we're going to open it up to more. If anyone else has any comments or questions, so I see another comment that says, uh, "Let's see here." So a very good point here. Ian is asking, do we have a platform or options for people to who need accessibility tools? Are there options or an example of a platform that has these options like Zoom or um, Altspace or the VR chat? Mozilla Hubs, you know, those platforms, are there options available or can we adopt, or can we, I'm sorry, can we host online events there? So Ian is asking us, you know, what's out there? Is what's out there already a good accommodation? Um, is it somewhere that we can consider to host a hackathon? And so I do have thoughts about that myself, but first I'd like to open the floor up to anyone else who might have a comment or wants to add to this. What platform do you think is good for a hackathon and do you use it? Hi, um, I, I'm Ian again. Um, I can add to that. So I was coordinating a piece of the most recent hackathon with our, our hybrid methodology. Um, this was our first time experimenting with trying to do a hybrid event and um, due to the time constraints, we, we had a lot of things that we wanted to try to achieve with it. And uh, just due to the reality of time, we had to pick one and go with it. What I ended up selecting for uh, us to use was a, an application called GatherTown, which has, it's a 2D interface with small uh like sprite characters that will walk around and when two characters walk up to each other the video feed comes up and, and they can chat directly um we selected this option because it had it was uh we, it fit our time constraint to get the everything set up uh within time but as we started to get into the event realizing that it didn't quite have the tooling that we needed um for everyone so one of the things that i've found most interesting about this symposium is learning about more accessibility tools. Um, one of the biggest ones being that there are live captioning options available through Altspace. And then also some of the resources that have been shared through the um, XR Accessibility GitHub, uh, the repository of, of projects for this purpose. And I would be curious to hear from other people in the community, what tools do you use? Or if there's any standout solutions um, and if there aren't standout solutions, what is currently lacking? What needs to be improved in this space? Um, because maybe 
uh, only having I, I uh, miles I, I like your comment earlier about what can we best do to host a hackathon that best supports accessibility and trying to mix both an in-person um, style as well as online um, where there might be friction trans trying to go between uh, in-person networking to like jumping into a, um, an immersive experience. Um, do people have thoughts on, on, on where, where we can improve upon this? Beautiful. Um, I was looking at Garther the town and I'm seeing a video that I found on Facebook or maybe it was an advertisement about an app that looked like a game, like a 2D game, you know, where two people can actually meet on the screen. Um, and that was my first exposure to seeing something set up in that way where you can interact. And for me, it was to interact with hearing people through captioning. Um, you know, but that app is run on the website um, with Brewer and you can use Chime to see the captions and they're automatic um, on Chrome as well. So I was curious to test that one out. And then another, uh, we had turned the floor over and we were going to talk about VR. I'm sorry, did you catch that interpreter? It was, I'm sorry, we were talking about alt space. We're not turning the floor over. Now we're discussing alt space program. Okay, so there's a little bit of a delay there in the captions. Apologize for that. So, um, having captions in for live events where a person can actually see what's being said live, we t I tested it there, and it, it wasn't bad. It was it was pretty decent. Um, but the challenge was for people with visual disabilities. Um, and various other challenges in that regard and I felt like the platform had a uh, web 3 um, abilities to run in the brewer and for the VR headset at the same time the hubs was also a good example of that um, and unfortunately there are no perfect tools that are a part of this work that we've been trying to develop um, so there are no tools that are perfect but so that's why we're developing the tools to meet the needs of those accessibility issues and we're doing the best we can with what we have um, so my dream absolutely is to be able to go into these environments and start having hackathons in virtual reality and actually meet other folks in these places and be able to join as if we were joining in a real space. That would be very cool. And so I know time is running out here. So with what's left, I would like to open it up for any burning questions or anything left. Oh, let's see here. We just got, got to move this thing. Um, if you'd like to continue chatting about this, we can keep the chat open um, in our XR Access Slack team. Not the current, uh, my hands are breaking, uh, not the current channel that we have right now, but going back to the main Access, um, XR Access Slack team, we can join there and have an ongoing conversation in the channel called Hackathon there. I'm actively in that channel. Also, if you wanted to continue this conversation with me, I think it's a good place for us to keep this up. But um, you can find it there, as I mentioned. And my goal is to continue meeting everyone. And even if it's a small group of people, we can develop a 